for families. I don't want anybody to get left out. And I don't care how far away you are from this stage. Jesus is walking up and down these aisles. Jesus is walking through this room. Jesus has healing in his wing. And if you touch the hem of his garment, you can't be. Have you heard? Have you heard about the wonder-working rebel priest, Jesus Christ the Nazarene? So they say, they say, I heard Jesus was coming by. And this is where it's very important who you hang out with. Because if this guy is sitting next to this guy, and this guy doesn't want to shout with this guy, Right now, I need you to just check and make sure you're sitting next to the right person. Ask them, are you the right person? Because I need somebody to believe with me, not doubt about me in this season of my life. You need the right partners, Chicago. You need the right partners. Some of you need to quit listening to my sermon and get your phone out and stop, start deleting people out of your phone because they're not the right partners. They're not the right people. They're, they're not bad people. They're just not bold people. So they start shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, I need to speak to a very specific type of person in the room right now because I'm losing you right now. You're like, well, I don't think it takes all that because the Lord hears me and I don't have to shout to get his attention. You're absolutely right. In fact, you know, I do not believe that you can just shout whatever you want, and then God's gonna drop it off on your doorstep, like Amazon Prime. God is not Amazon Prime, God is not DoorDash. God is not Uber Eats. So that's not what I'm saying. And I wish it worked that way, because that would be an amazing sermon to come in here and preach, and it would make everybody happy. Like, whatever you want from the Lord, just shout it right now, and it'll be waiting for you when you get home tonight. By the time you get out of the parking garage tonight, it'll be there waiting for you. You know, single people start shouting, Husband! Six foot four! Physique like Ryan Gosling and has the Book of Romans memorized! Husband! Because I'm using the shout of these men to demonstrate something in your life is that the voice that becomes the loudest determines the direction you move into. And what is so interesting about these men, not only did they hear Jesus was coming, but they shouted, even though they didn't have use of their eyes, they had use of their mouths, they had use of their lungs, they had use of their breath. You've got to start using what you do have and stop letting the devil remind you of what you don't have. What you used to have. What you think you should have. What you compare yourself to everybody else's fake life on social media and think if I had that, they don't have that either. They only had that for three seconds when they took the picture and then they went back to their real life and you are comparing your behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels and that will make you miserable. But if you get your eyes off of them and focus your eyes on what God has given you, you get grateful. You get grateful. You start realizing I've got a lot. And they shout, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And look at verse 31, because this is what always happens. When they were shouting the crowd, the crowd, remember the shouts of the crowd are not reliable guides for your decisions in life. The crowd rebuked them and told them, stop shouting. Now watch what they did. When the crowd told them, stop shouting, they shouted loud. real quick. It'll, it'll be worth it. This side of the room over, all the way over here. You're going to be the crowd. Real quick. I need you to shout, stop! stop. And this, 
outside, you're going to be like the two men, and I want you to shout, Lord! Lord! Now, every time they say stop, I need you to get more determined about what you're saying. You say, stop. You say, stop. You say, And all you got to do is be louder. That's what I want to happen in your spirit tonight. That the voice of the Lord gets louder than the voice of your fear. That the voice of the Lord and what he spoke over your life gets louder than the voice of shame. It is not the crowd around us that paralyzes us and keeps us from coming to Jesus. It is the crowd inside of us. The voice inside of us saying, you stay right there. You are an addict. You will always be an addict. You, you blew that relationship. You don't deserve another one. The reason people keep leaving your life is because you're unlovable. You stay right there. Even during worship, it happens every time we're gathered like this. There will be those who want to worship God, but you don't feel worthy to worship God. There are those that want to give Him your life, but you feel like, what life? What do I have left to give Him? There is nothing but broken pieces. May I introduce you to two men who sat by the road and nobody paid attention to them? And nobody thought that they were worthy and nobody thought that they were worth stopping for? And the Savior of the world on His way to redeem humanity stop for two men who refuse to stop shouting i'm looking for somebody tonight who refuses to stop who refuses to stop pursuing the calling that's on your life who refuses to stop seeking freedom who refuses to stop loving who refuses to stop persisting i taught my daughter abby when she was like seven years old how to swim from one end of the pool to the other without coming up for a breath. And you saw her a few minutes ago. She's, she's much bigger now. And she's very bold. She has no problem getting on stage in front of, how many people are here tonight? Like, lots. The town I grew up in was 6,000 people. The whole town. Monk's Corner, South Carolina. You think it's not scary getting up in front of 12,000 people? And preaching the word. Well, Abby doesn't even think about it. I asked her, I was like, baby, will you say the blessing to the people on? And I thought I was going to have to bribe her or buy her or something like that. But she was like, yeah, I'd love to. No problem. Just give me the mic. Just <laughs> <laughs> my mic. What kind of her spirit? Yeah, it's really cool. But she was, she was trying to hold her breath and go from one end of the pool to the other. It's kind of a silly illustration, but I want to share with you. Because I think it can give you a picture. And so she wanted to do it because her brother's did it later, they did it when they were like nine years old, she wanted to do it when she was seven, so she wanted to get from one end of the pool to the other. And I told her, now when you go down there, you're gonna hear a voice in your mind saying, you have to come up right now or you're gonna die. But that's not real, that's not true. Um, I said, that's the lizard brain. And I don't think this is scientifically correct, but it worked, so I'm glad I did it. And I was like, that's the lizard brain, that's the survival-based part of the brain, it's about the amygdala, but, but we call it the lizard brain, and it's gonna be yelling at you, telling you, come up for air right now, you're gonna die. But you're not. So don't listen to the lizard. Just keep swimming. And so she does it on her first try. She goes down and comes back up. And she goes, <gasps> Man, that lizard is loud. <laughs> I said, I know. But you made it. What did you tell the lizard? And she said, Shut up, lizard. I'm doing this. <laughs> I need somebody tonight with the faith of a seven-year-old to tell fear, to tell depression, to tell anxiety, to tell the chains that have been holding you down, shut up fear. I'm doing this. I'm doing this for my children. I'm doing this for a generation yet to be born. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this because God called me to do it. And I will not stop just because my insecurity says stop. I come against the spirit of suicide tonight. 
Some of you, the devil has been trying to get you to give up on your very life, telling you that your life is not worth living. But that makes me wonder, if the devil has been attacking you at that level, telling you that your life is not worth living, what does the enemy know about you that intimidates him so much that he's trying so hard to get rid of you? I found out that the devil only has so many weapons. He doesn't waste weapons. So if you've been under attack lately, it might be a sign that the assignment on your life is so mighty that the enemy knows if he doesn't take you out right now, you are close to something that God spoke over your life. Somebody shout, I'm doing this. And they had to shout when they couldn't see. And you have to believe when you can't feel it. And you have to worship God when the last thing you feel like doing is lift your hands. Confuse the devil. Lift your hands when you feel like staying in bed. Lift your hands when you feel like hanging your head. Confuse the enemy. Throw him into confusion every once in a while. I learned that God does some of his best work when we can't see him doing it. I met a lady on this tour who said, your preaching helped me survive the pandemic. She lost her husband. And she said that the preaching helped her survive the pandemic. And what I didn't have time to tell her was that when we were preaching through the pandemic, honestly, y'all, it was weird because I was preaching and the room was empty the first few weeks of the pandemic. And the only people there were Holly and like five or 10 of my best staff and the worship team and the cameraman. And I think one of the cameramen was smoking. Um, I just made that up for dramatic effect. I don't really think that was true. But it was so, it was so weird and so uncertain. And I remember when, one of those first sermons in, in COVID, I was up there preaching and I was just trying to, I was just trying to preach like there were thousands of people there and I was trying, but I couldn't really feel anything because there's not that many people in the room. And Holly was doing her best to shout me down, but you know, and uh, Holly's over there shouting, let the wild hog eat! And, and it's nothing's working, you know. I kind of come off stage kind of discouraged, like, man, that was stupid. That, I don't even know if that made any sense what I said. And one of our staff members said, you just preached over 100,000 people for the first time in your life wow. during that sermon online the most people I'd ever preached to and God was doing the most when I was seeing the least when I was seeing the least he was doing the most don't worry if you can't see the next step right now you walk in the light that you have God is working on your surrender right now God is teaching you to trust him right now. He's teaching you to walk by faith and not by sight. He didn't leave you. You say, I can't hear God right now. I can't feel God right now. Remember, the men in the passage had to shout when Jesus was far away. But when he called them close, they didn't have to shout anymore. When God is close, he can whisper. And you can hear him. You can hear him. He can touch you. He's close tonight. He knows what you deal with that nobody else knows that you deal with. He knows what you struggle with and suffer from that nobody. He knows what the abuse was that led to the trauma that led to the addiction. He knows all of that. And he is close enough to touch you tonight. I find it beautiful, Chicago, that because these two men would not stop, would not stop shouting, would not stop believing, because they would not stop. Verse 32 says something amazing, that because they would not stop, Jesus stopped. Let's thank God tonight for a Savior who stops. stopping 
by to see about you in this moment, stopping by to mend a broken heart, stopping by to tell you everything's gonna be all right, child, stopping by to remind you that he sees every tear and he's building a testimony right now. And you are going to stand and give God glory for this storm that he's bringing you through. You are, he's close. Because these men, if they were born blind, I want you to think about the fact that the very first thing they saw when they opened their eyes was Jesus. How amazing that the very first thing they saw was Jesus. We came tonight not just to sing songs. We came to see Jesus. I prayed before I came around this corner to preach to you tonight that God would show you your next step to take. That he would show you your next move. That he would show you and remind you what he's put inside of you. Because I need you to know that what happened to these formerly blind men can happen to you too. The Bible says that they followed Jesus and they never went back to Jericho again. Somebody shout, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to Jericho. They followed him to Jerusalem. They saw him as he gave his life for the world. And it all started with a shout. It all started with a shout. One shout in Jericho. And it changed their life. And I want to tell you before I close my message tonight about another shout in the Bible that happened in Jericho. Yes. I want to tell you about a shout that happened in Jericho that brought the walls down. I want to tell you about a shout of faith and what God can do through an act of faith. And I need you to stand up on your feet right now because in just a moment, we are going to release a shout in this room. Not yet. I want you to hold it as I explain to you the power of a shout in Jericho. The Bible says that after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God led his people finally to the promised land. And he gave them an instruction as they got to the first city called Jericho. He told them to walk around the walls once every day. For six days and every day that they walked around the walls nothing happened every day they walked around the walls they saw no progress every day they went home after walking around those walls one time I'm sure they wondered is this working at all but they did it the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next and the next day until the seventh day. Everybody shout seven. seven. Come on, Chicago. I need you to shout seven. seven. Sometimes you just take one lap and you give up. Sometimes you just take two laps and you give up. But on the seventh day, they marched around seven times. And the Bible says that on the seventh time, God gave them a very specific instruction. He said, on the seventh time around the walls, when you hear the sound of the trumpet blast have the whole army watch this give a loud shout wait a minute this reminds me of the two blind men in Jericho what did they do What did the armies of Israel do when they got to the walls of Jericho? What do you do when you're looking at a wall of discouragement? What do you do when you're looking at something that you can't get over? What do you do when the enemy is saying you're never going to make it? Stay down there. What do you do when you think of the goodness of Jesus? I need somebody in Chicago.
just stirring up our energy it's not just having a concert what we're doing tonight is waging war on the adversary that came to kill and steal and destroy and declare that Satan has no victory over your life so let me tell you why we're gonna shout in a minute we're about to make the biggest shout of all and here's why are you ready Chicago is a weapon. Praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. It's more than a sound. My praise is a weapon. Chicago, who can turn a grave into 